Greetings from First United Methodist Church of Los Alamos, New Mexico. We hope this message will be meaningful and relevant to your life and your relationship with God. We invite you to join us for worship on Sunday mornings. We have now resumed in-person worship with one service at 10 a.m., which is live streamed both on Facebook and on YouTube. We alternate each week between contemporary and traditional music. You may confirm worship times and receive more information by visiting our website, firstinyourheart.org. Now may you be blessed through the reading and hearing of God's holy word. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the 45th chapter of Genesis. Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers, and then, after getting out of prison, rises to power as the Pharaoh's steward, overseeing Egypt, when he has encounters with his brothers, who have come to Egypt seeking assistance because of the drought in the land. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth, and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And now your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my own mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt and all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, while Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. So, so far in this journey of forgiveness, we have looked at some of the myths of forgiveness or things that forgiveness is not, some of the reasons why we need to forgive, and then last week we looked at the steps of forgiveness, how we actually begin to forgive people if ever so briefly, and we're going to return that today as we move on to the idea of forgiveness in families. Now, the steps to forgiveness in families aren't really any different than the steps we take for forgiveness for anyone else except that the hurts we receive from family members or those closest to us are often deeper and bigger and heavier to carry than the ones we receive from friends or acquaintances or strangers because we have greater expectations for those that we are close to, those that we love. Expectations about love and about trust, and when those things are violated, which is most often what we need to forgive in families, those are bigger stones, bigger hurts that we carry with us. And so I thought it necessary to try and address specifically those types of hurts. But before we get into those and how we forgive in families, I wanted to switch things up because while we have been talking about how we forgive others, we haven't really talked about how we seek forgiveness. That is, that we could probably do this just as its own message as well. But just as it's important to talk about the rocks that we carry around that have other people's names on them, we have to remember the rocks, the hurts that we have given to others that have our names on them that others are carrying around. And so Reverend Adam Hamilton says that there are six words that everyone needs to know in order to be in relationship with each other. 
The first three, he says, are hard, and that is, I forgive you. But the other three may be even harder to say, and so we're going to practice saying them here this morning, and that is, please forgive me. Can we say those together? Put the next slide up, Apple. Put down your phone. Thank you. So let's say that together. Please forgive me. Right? So those are the six words, he says, that we need to, to, to know and to practice and to say in order to be in a relationship, I forgive you, please forgive me. And this is where I think I disagree with him, is I think there's an additional six words that have to go with the please forgive me. And the first of those is, I was wrong. And let's try that. That's a hard one too. I was wrong. And then finally, I am sorry. Let's try that again. I am sorry. So the reason we're practicing this now is it's a lot easier to say it when there's nothing on the line, right? And to practice saying those words, it's much harder when we actually have to say it to somebody else. And so now we're going to say those nine words together. Please forgive me. I was wrong. I am sorry. And it doesn't matter which order you say those in. You could say, I'm sorry, please forgive me, I was wrong, right? It doesn't matter which order, but those are the nine key words you need to say. And you might add into that what it is that you're actually sorry for, right? When you're asking or seeking to give forgiveness, one of the things you have to say is what hurts you, why it was wrong, right? Those sorts of things. So if you're going to seek forgiveness, it's sort of the same thing of saying what I did was wrong, Here's why I know it's wrong. And this is not in a time to make an excuse, right? There's a book called, Yes, God, I have sinned, but I have several excellent excuses. When we're seeking forgiveness, it's not about giving excuses about why we did something. If you want to give for excuses, then you're saying automatically, I don't think it's as bad as you really thought. Right? Because I can make an excuse about why I did what I did. And we can certainly do that. But that's not what we do when we are seeking forgiveness. And if we're just seeking to be absolved of our own guilt, that too is not seeking forgiveness because that makes it about us, not about the person we are seeking forgiveness from. And so the one exception I would throw out there about excuses is if you are willing to say, this is what I did, this is a reason why, and here's what I learned from that experience, right? So I once messed up with somebody and didn't give him assistance in a time of crisis that he expected, and honestly, I was also in a time of crisis, right? That's my excuse. But when he told me how this hurt him, I said, I'm, I'm really sorry. You're right. I was not there for you the way I, I should have been. Please forgive me. He never said back, I forgive you. And I don't know whether he ever did or if he was just in beginning sort of processes of, of that step of needing to say, you hurt me. And I, again, didn't give my excuse the first time we had that conversation. But later on, we were talking and I said, you know, I still think about this. And here's what I was, I was going through. And I say that not as an excuse. I say that because here's what I learned. And here's the changes I've made. So I hope I don't ever do that again, right? Please forgive me. That's not my excuse for it because I can't give an excuse. But here's what I learned from the, what I was going through at the time. So simple steps again. If we need to seek forgiveness, tell them what you did, why it was wrong. Say, please forgive me. I was wrong. I'm sorry. That's as easy and as simple as it can be. And then what they do is t entirely up to you. You cannot demand that they forgive you. Forgiveness is a gift freely given by the person who was hurt. So you can go and seek forgiveness and they can say, I don't forgive you, I will never forgive you. And we'll talk about next couple of weeks about what we do, do if that happens as we're seeking forgiveness. But you cannot demand somebody else to forgive you. And if you are seeking forgiveness, you should also be open to hearing their story, their side of it, as well as what they might need from you in order to restore that relationship, if that's possible, 
or to bring some sense of justice to them. Part of what's called restorative justice versus uh, retributive justice, which is a, what the criminal justice system does. And there's so much more we could say about that. But brief and to the point, be sincere, actually seeking forgiveness. I was wrong. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Now, in his novel, Anna Karenina, Leo Tolstoy said, all happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And so what we also find is that the dysfunctions and traumas that in, are in families, even if they're the same sorts of things, are unique to that family and they can also be intergenerational. That is, they are passed down from one generation to the next. And why does that happen? First, because we tend to do what we are taught to do, either taught direct, uh, intentionally or what we observe that is happening. And so our parenting skills tend to be fairly similar to what our parents' parenting skills were like, and their parenting skills were similar to what the previous generation and on and on. If there are changes to that, often it's because we said, I'm never going to do that to my kids, right? Often we say that as children, and then we find ourselves as parents doing that. But often there are things that we stop that trauma and dysfunction and say, I'm not going to do that. And we see changes in the end of those things. And so some people say that, you know, Forgiveness within families as it goes to parents, we just have to assume that our parents did the best job that they could. And some, some people who are writing on forgiveness says, therefore, you never need to forgive your parents for anything because they did the best they could in everything. I, I don't think you can push it that far because there are some things that parents do I just don't think we can say as an excuse they did the best they could because clearly they didn't. Or if that was the best, maybe they should have thought about not being parents, right? Some of you have had that experience in your households. So it's not that they did the best they could and therefore they get off the hook. That's not what this is about. But it does mean that sometimes in forgiveness, we need to think just beyond about what happened to us and about the wrongs that happened to us. And about what happened to our parents, right? Those intergenerational traumas that get passed down. And as we think about dysfunctional families, I think Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and his brothers have to be a great example of multi-generational dysfunction. So a quick recap of story of Genesis. Abraham has two sons with two different women, and it's clear that Sarah is not just a preferenced wife, but also Isaac is the preferenced son, so much that Sarah demands that Ishmael and his mother be kicked out of the house. And so you would think that Isaac would then learn a lesson about the dangers and damages that come with giving preference to one person over somebody else, but he doesn't. And so he favors his older son Esau and his wife, who gives birth to Jacob, favors Jacob. And so again, you see this dysfunction taking place. And Jacob sort of wins that battle, although in order to win it, he has to flee for his life. And so you would think that Jacob would learn the lesson about the dangers and damages that come with preferencing one child over another. But he doesn't. And so he preferences Joseph over his 11 brothers. And then the same issues repeat themselves. And so not only do the 11 brothers then resent Joseph because of this special treatment that he receives, which includes uh, receiving the famous Technicolor dream coats, and he looks amazingly just like Donny Osmond. Maybe that's another reason why the brothers resent him. I'm not quite sure. But we also have to remember that before his brothers decide to sell Joseph into slavery, the Joseph really is a jerk. Go back and read the story. He sort of rubs his brother's noses in his favoritism of how his, his father views him. And so as we're talking about forgiveness, sometimes we have to realize as we're telling that story about 
why we need to forgive somebody, that sometimes we play a role in that and we need to seek forgiveness at the same time we are, uh, to give forgiveness same time we are seeking forgiveness. Now, does the fact that we may have played a role or that Joseph may have played a role in his brothers disliking him wipe out the, the idea or the, the reality that they sold him into slavery? No. He is not the, he's a victim of what they did, right? He played a role in their dislike, but they chose to hurt him in that way. Joseph plays no role in that. He's not responsible for his victim status of what happened. So this is not victim blaming. Joseph is not responsible for his brother's actions. But stepping away from that story for just a moment, there are several other considerations we need to take into account as forgiveness that, that play in this story. And the first is to try and know or to remember the backstory of the people who hurt us. That's clearly the case in Joseph's story. As I said last week, hurt people tend to hurt people, right? People who abuse have often been abused, right? It just gets transmitted. The criminologist Jillian Peterson began her career studying people on death row, and she said what she found very early in her career was that the worse the crime was, the worse the backstory of the criminal would be. The more they got hurt, the more they hurt, tried to hurt the world. Right? Does that explain away what happened? No. Does it justify what they did? No. Is it an excuse for what they did? No. But it does, when we know those stories, tend to soften the edges around our feelings so that we can begin to see them as hurting human beings. Desmond Tutu wrote about a time in which he stopped at a convenience store in the height of apartheid in South Africa. And he said he went inside and the white store clerk called him a particularly derogatory name and told him that he could not come into the store or use the, to buy anything or even to use the restrooms, not just him, but his family who were traveling with him. And he said he carried that hurt with him for a while, but then he began to put himself in the other man's shoes. And he said, I could not be for certain that if I had been born into South Africa and apartheid as a white man and been taught everything that that store clerk had been taught, that I wouldn't have done exactly the same thing as a white man to an African man walking into my store. And he said that made it easier for him to practice forgiveness of putting himself, of seeing where that man was and everything he'd been taught and saying, I could have been that man too. And again, I want to be clear, this does not justify the behavior or say that it's okay to hurt someone else. Because to give forgiveness says that it hurt us and that it was wrong, right? That's part of the process of seeking to give forgiveness is to name those hurts. But it does give us perspective about the humanity of others and of their hurts. And remembering, as Richard Rohr says, that pain that is not transformed will be transmitted. And so what we're working on in forgiveness is transforming our pain so that we don't intentionally go out and hurt others too. Another step is to assume the best of intention. Sometimes this can be hard, maybe even impossible, right? I don't think that Joseph can assume the best of intentions when his brother sold him into slavery. That's, that's a harder one to do. But it often can reframe the situation for us by putting it in a different light. So again, the person who's driving like an idiot and speeding past us, rather than thinking terrible thoughts about them, we can say, maybe they're rushing to the hospital. Maybe they just got the worst possible news they've ever received and they're rushing to be with somebody else. Right? It doesn't change what they're doing, but it does change how we perceive what they're doing and how it impacts us. And that leads into the other 
part, and we'll say more about this later too, and that is not to take things so personally. And this is hard because, again, there are things that happen to us that are personal, that are done specifically against us or because of us. But most things that happen into our lives, guess what? People aren't even thinking about us at all. Most people who hurt us do so because they are hurting. And what they're doing is not intentional to us. And so, again, if we're thinking about those hurts that we carry, thinking about did they intend to hurt me or I was just sort of accidental in this process can help us to lessen the size of that wound in order to process how we move forward. So again, the example of that idiot driver driving by and they cut us off. Now, if it was about us, if we had been engaging in some sort of road rage with them, then then it's about us, right? But we have to take responsibility for what led up to that and not only give forgiveness, but seek forgiveness. But if we're just driving down the road and they do something stupid in front of us, more than likely, again, they're not even thinking about who you are. They have no idea who you are and they don't care about you. It just happens to be that it happened to us. And so if we assume the best of intention, we say they're rushing off to a hospital and I'm going to give them grace, right? And if we take it personally, then what happens? Well, we get upset about it. And then we come into work or someplace else and we take out our frustration on somebody else. And then they go to lunch and they take out their frustration on the waiter, Right? And then the waiter takes it out on somebody else in the restaurant. Or maybe they take it out on the Speedway person on their way home picking up something to, to snack on. Right? And that, and that Speedway person takes out another customer. That customer leaves and cuts somebody off. Right? It just becomes this ever, never-ending cycle of frustration and anger that builds up and carries on. And somehow it all makes its way to the Middle East where it lives. I think that's how that works anyways. But if we said it's not about me and we assume the best of intentions for what happened, then that doesn't become frustration and anger for us, right? It's not about us. Smiths being out of something that we need, they didn't say, hey, I'm going to be out of milk because John's coming in, right? That's not how they operate. Someplace being short-staffed and so it takes longer than we think it should is not about us. Doctors and insurance companies making decisions that we disagree with and it impact us, it's not about us. It it, it certainly impacts us, but they didn't make that decision thinking, I know John is going to call in 10 minutes and I just want to piss him off. And normally the person we yell at at the doctor's office insurance company at Smith's is not the person who had anything to do with those decisions, right? But if we choose not to take things personally, then it becomes like water on a duck's back. It just washes off of us. We don't need to be angry and upset about these things. We don't need to carry around these hurts. So try and know the the story, and this is, again, easier in families, of why they're living the way they are. What are their hurts that are causing them to act out? Assume the best of intentions, and then try not to take things personally, not just with those we love, but with everyone. And so that leads us then back to Joseph. Because there are lots of things in this story that we don't know. Does Joseph take responsibility for how he was a jerk to his brothers? Never said. We don't know, but perhaps the time that's elapsed from when he was sold into slavery to when he encounters his brothers has helped him get a different perspective, helped him change his heart and his view about the events that led up to this moment. And we'll talk about whether God caused this or God was responsible for this when we, in our, third, our last message in three weeks. But I do think that probably how he responds has a lot to do with the time that's elapsed. Because it's been 22 years since Jesus, uh, Joseph was sold into slavery to this moment that we heard this morning, which helps explain why the brothers don't recognize him. He was 17 when they last saw him, and now he's 39. Would Joseph have been able to forgive his brothers, or at least forgive them as quickly 
If they had come to Egypt in the first couple of years, if he had countered them when he was in prison in Egypt, would he have been as quick to forgive? Maybe, but maybe not. Because sometimes time does help us to see things in different ways. It's not that time heals all wounds, right? We hear that. That's one of those myths. The time does not heal all wounds. Sometimes that wound is just as fresh 22 years later as it was on day one. Sometimes we've masked over it, but if we rip off that bandage, it's still festering there underneath everything else. But sometimes time causes us to see things in different ways. Sometimes age allows us to see things in different ways doesn't mean they aren't still raw and hurting, but they can help us to process better. And we should also note that it is possible to forgive too soon or to give forgiveness too soon. That's not that we can't be get going through the process of forgiving. It doesn't stop our work. But if we tell someone, I forgive you before they have done their work, of accepting guilt and responsibility, then we've wiped that off for them. They don't have to do any of that work, right? So it is, you should be begin the process of forgiveness as soon as you can, but it is possible to give that forgiveness to somebody else too soon. Which leads to the last point, and that is whether or how or why we need to confront someone for the harms they've done for us and give them forgiveness. And so last week, when we were going through the steps, I said that most of the time, we probably don't actually need to physically confront the person who hurt us. And that goes against what you'll read in most books about forgiveness. But there are several reasons why I say that. One of them is that being confronted often causes the other person to get defensive. Right? And it's potentially that leads to anger. And so if you go to somebody and said, you hurt me and I forgive you, and they respond with anger, what have you just done to your forgiveness process? You've just set it back. You're back at square one. Right? So sometimes, again, I'd say even most of the time, that's not helpful to us. It's also possible that they can and will deny that they did anything to hurt you. Or that if only you saw it the way they saw it, right? It was just a joke. I didn't mean anything by it, right? They're trying to wipe your feelings and emotions away. They're trying to gaslight you in some cases. And they might even deny they did anything wrong. And sometimes that might be the case. So I've been in managerial positions for more than 30 years and I have terminated my share of employees. Only one time in more than 30 years has an employee thanked me for firing them. Right? And he said, hopefully this will be the, the impetus I need to get my back, life back on track. And I hope that happened. I don't know. But most other people I fired, I think they're carrying a rock around with my name on it. Right? Because I hurt them. I don't know that anybody who's been fired feels positive about it on the other side of it. But did I do anything wrong? I mean, I learned some things over the years from the way I did it to start and the way I do it now. But often I'll say, I'm sorry it's come to this, right? We, here's all the steps we did to try and correct this, and it hasn't made a difference. You can't work here anymore, right? That hurts them, but am I guilty for anything? No. And so them coming to, to me and saying, I forgive you for firing me, say, well, that's great, but I didn't do anything wrong. Right? So that might be a process, again, where we need to do that work for ourselves to give forgiveness, but going to the person that we perceived as a hurt is not really helpful to us. But for family members, for close friends, for those with whom we want to reconcile, and we're going to talk about reconciliation next week, the confronting them, the telling of the story to that person is necessary. And the things that can happen as a result of that are still possibilities. And so we need to prepare for that. You need to prepare that this person might respond to me with anger or with denial or with gaslighting or telling me it was all my fault. 
right? And so one of the ways to deal with that is talk with a counselor. And if you're working with uh, forgiveness on really big issues, you should have a counselor as part of that process to talk with your counselor, work with a role playing or with the person you've asked to, to support you in this process, right? Somebody who's praying for you. Say, can you play this person and let's role play how I'm going to respond if they respond in this way. So you're ready for it. And again, if the purpose of you going to them to tell them the story is so that they realize how much of a schmuck they are, that's not the forgiveness process. That's just another form of retaliation, right? The purpose is to tell your story, to get it all out so that you can move forward leaving those things behind you. And perhaps they can also then seek forgiveness from you. Right? This can be a, a healthy and happy process, and it can also lead to some pain. Right? Just as you'll experience pain as you work through telling that story again and naming why it hurts you, telling your pain to somebody else can lead for them to relive that moment. And maybe this is the first time they realize what they did actually did hurt you, right? They didn't understand the ram full ramifications. Or maybe they've been carrying that weight around with them as well. And this is a freeing exercise for both of you. But if you can't confront them or you don't want to confront them, like I said last week, you can write them a letter knowing that you're never going to send it. This is especially true if they passed on Right? If the person who hurt you has died, or you have no contact with them and have no uh, way to be in contact with them, writing them a letter knowing you can't send it is a great way to do it. Or again, you set down the two chairs, you're in one, the other chair is empty, and you visualize that person sitting there. Again, they can be passed on, you're visualizing, or you have somebody who represents them sitting in that chair so you can tell your story to them. The story of Joseph and his brothers is rich in so many ways, but especially in this story of forgiveness. Because Joseph is able to forgive his brothers for what they have done. But he not only forgives them, he is seeking their betterments. He's concerned about their welfare. And the de definition we've been using for forgiveness comes from Dr. Joanna North, and she says, when unjustly hurt by another, we forgive when we overcome the resentment toward the offender, not by denying our right to the resentments, but instead by offering the wrongdoer compassion, benevolence, and love. And so that's what Joseph does. Think about that story. I mean, they do irreparable harm. They sell him not into, just into slavery, but he ends up in prison. And when they come to him... He offers them compassion, benevolence, and love on top of the forgiveness. And so what he also does is he stops that family trauma. He stops that intergenerational wrongdoing that passes from father and mother to child and from that child to their children, right? He writes a new story for this family. He writes a new future for this family. He sets a new story of hope so that the hurt no longer continues to hurt and to cause harm. Rather than transmitting his pain to his brothers, which he has the power to do, he instead trans transformed with it and he transforms this relationship. The same reality is available to us when we too choose to transform our pain rather than transmit it, when we choose to forgive. I pray that it will be so, my brothers and sisters. Amen. And so I'm going to invite you to, again, take out your worship insert on the back there, and we're going to spend our minutes thinking about, again, forgiveness about maybe somebody in your family that you need to seek forgiveness for, maybe somebody you need to give forgiveness for, of how you might work on not taking things personally or assuming the best of intentions 
or hearing somebody else so we can understand their hurts, so we can return humanity back to them. So we're going to spend a, a minute and invite you to write those things down. Thank you for watching and don't forget to follow our YouTube channel and Twitter and like us on Facebook if you haven't already. And remember that every action you take today could change someone's life. So make sure it's a good one and be an agent of love. God bless.